c'est un grand honneur, puis un grand jour, puis aujourd'hui, j'aimerais mentionner que c'est vraiment un privilège de pouvoir présenter notre dernière lauréate du prix Quilam, qui est une femme. On est le 6 décembre, on a commencé à parler des femmes en général et de, de, du triste événement qui, que nous commémorons aujourd'hui, mais j'aimerais aussi célébrer le bonheur d'avoir une femme de science de haut calibre qui a obtenu le prix qu'il aime. Et aussi, j'aimerais dire qu'il y a très peu de femmes qui l'ont eu depuis sa création. Donc le prix, on m'a informé de sources sûres, que le prix, les prix qu'il aime étaient octroyés depuis 1981 et euh, depuis 1981, il y a eu 18 femmes sur 148 qui l'ont obtenu, soit 12%. Et nous en avons une aujourd'hui. Alors nous devrions être très fiers de finir les lauréats. Oui, je pense que vous pouvez applaudir. I, I was just starting, hein? <laughs> no, I won't say much. Okay. Uh, ce que je voudrais juste dire, d'abord... Personnellement, j'ai cru que je connaissais euh, euh, Janet Worker depuis mon arrivée. En fait, c'est faux, c'est une illusion. On m'en avait parlé quand j'étais encore en Europe, avant d'immigrer ici, et j'ai immigré ici en 85. Donc, en fait, on a vérifié, et effectivement, on avait un mentor en commun, Jacques Meller, et elle avait publié des papiers vraiment importants en 81 déjà. Et ça, ne fait, ça a continué jusqu'à aujourd'hui. Elle a publié dans les meilleures revues comme Nature, PNAS, for those of you who are not in science, Proceedings of National Academy of Science. C'était de très, très haut calibre. Ce sont toutes des revues. Et elle continue. Hein. C'était au début, mais elle continue encore. Donc, j'ai encore vu qu'il y avait un papier en 2015, un papi dans PNAS, 2015, 2017. Ah, oh, you don't hear anything? Ah. Ok, tant pis. Elle ne pourra pas vérifier les faits. <rire> Mais j'ai vérifié, croyez-moi. Euh, elle a de nombreux prix. Vous avez tout ça dans euh, la description. Euh, elle a obtenu un doctorat en psychologie développementale de l'Université euh, de British Columbia. Euh, donc, elle est canadienne aussi. Mais en fait, elle n'est pas née au Canada. Elle est américaine. Donc, c'est une de nos heureuses « American refugees ». Mais elle a été diplômée ici, elle a bénéficié de l'éducation canadienne. Et, euh, elle a été à Dalhousie aussi. Euh, mais moi, ce que je voudrais surtout euh, mentionner, c'est la femme de science qui a énormément contribué, et évidemment c'est à elle à en parler, pas à moi, sur les fondements neurobiologiques du langage et du bilinguisme, avant que tout le monde s'y intéresse. Donc voilà pourquoi, effectivement, euh, je la connaissais avant de la connaître vraiment euh, et que c'est un honneur de pouvoir la présenter. Maintenant, c'est aussi une femme euh, très généreuse euh, euh, qui, euh, très généreusement même, m'a rappelé que les femmes ne portaient pas les insignes. Alors, vous, vous m'en voyez. Euh, elle m'a rappelé ça hier. Euh, c'est aussi une femme qui est exceptionnelle à plusieurs euh, niveaux. Elle a des liens fort aussi avec notre université. Elle fait partie d'un réseau qui travaille sur le cerveau avec, qui est dirigé par Sarah Lippé, qui est là, qui aurait sûrement aimé être à ma place. J'en doute pas. Alors, sans plus tard... Ah non, j'ai non, non. Il faut que je mentionne aussi qu'elle est énormément citée, avec plus que 25 000 citations. Et comme on avait déjà mentionné ça pour... Euh, le premier, je mentionnerai qu'elle a un, un index H de 80, suivant euh, mes dernières euh, vérifications. Alors, qu'est-ce que j'oublie J'oublie sûrement beaucoup de choses, mais j'aimerais juste que vous reteniez ça, c'est que c'est une grande dame qu'on a aujourd'hui euh, de la psychologie, c'est pas une discipline très lointaine de la mienne, je m'en excuse, euh, je, je, I will translate everything later. Euh, mais je, sans plus tarder, euh, je vous présente Janet Worker. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so it's an absolute pleasure to be here um, and to talk to you about my thoughts about the importance of rhythm. 
um, coming from the interactions uh, with this group. And I'll, I'll be talking about rhythm in early child development and the acquisition of language. So as uh, you've heard throughout this meeting, um, there's rhythm or cyclicity in many aspects of the or perhaps all aspects of the physical and natural world. So we have the phases of the moon, which influence the tides. We have um, oscillations um, in the newborn brain, in the, all of our brains. We have the heartbeat, so we have intrinsic um, oscillations and rhythmicity. We have uh, diurnal cycles and animals that um, entrained to those so that, or at least respond to those, so we wake up uh, to the rooster, we see the owl at night, so we have diurnal and uh, nocturnal animals. And most, if not all, animals and plants synchronize their biological functions to naturally occurring rhythms. So you see there, you know, the bear hibernating, the seasons of the world, my favorite when you're in Italy, seeing the sunflowers facing east in the morning and west in the afternoon. And I just put this in at the last moment to uh, uh, connect to Walter's talk that many animals can synchronize evolved behaviors. But synchronization of evolved behaviors is different than what we as humans do, because we as humans are arguably unique in being able to synchronize to a variety or to entrain to a variety of external beats. Um, and this is just um, to um, point to some of the really fundamental work Virginia Pinhoon and Robert Zatore here from Montreal have done on rhythm and timing in the premotor cortex. So uh, to turn to um, one of my idols, who's no longer with us, um, Oliver Sacks has also made um, these points about humans being unique in being able to entrain um, quite flexibly to many aspects of the external world. And he argues that this may well have had a crucial cultural and economic function in human evolution, bringing people together, producing a sense of collectivity and community. And I'll be talking about some of that. He also goes on to say, my impression is that a sense of rhythm, which has no analog in language, and that I'll be disagreeing with, providing you some evidence, um, but the rest of this I agree with, is unique, and that its correlation with movement is unique to human beings. Why else would children start to dance when they are two or three? Chimpanzees don't dance. Um, so the roadmap of this talk, is I'll be talking a bit about rhythm in human interactions, rhythm in child development, and then rhythm in language development. Um, the dance, the turn taking between mothers and infants or parents and infants um, is something that um, we see from almost immediately after birth. Um, there's agreement that parents, the adult plays a big role in synchronizing this interaction. There's disagreement about how much and when the baby also starts playing a role in this synchronization, but it's there very early. And there's considerable research now that this dance, this interpersonal interaction, um, supports emotional attachment between the parent and the infant. And in my domain, it also changes the quality of infant vocalizations. So even before they're babbling, they're, the vocalizations that babies make sound more, are judged by adults to sound more language-like when there is turn-taking in the interaction um, of vocalizations than when there isn't. And of course, as humans, we entrain not only to one another, but also to external beats. And these two pictures show both of those. A couple dancing together or dancing to external beats of music, but also synchronizing with one another. And musicians playing together again are creating their own music that gives external beats. But also, there's a lot of beautiful work on the synchrony um, among uh, musicians when they're performing. So as I mentioned, by and large, other animals do not flexibly entrain 
which is why Snowball um, is so fascinating. So this is a cockatoo. Annie Patel has studied. Okay, many of you have probably seen him before, and that's not the best selection, but that's the one I could get with a Creative Commons license. So in humans, moving together um, supports uh, social cohesion and pro social behavior. So there's an enormous amount of research as well that when we uh, dance together, when we pray together, um, when we become synchronized, which would be so cool if we all had little EEGs on our heads right now as we start thinking about similar topics together, that we feel more responsible for one another, we're more likely to engage in pro-social behavior um, and help each other. And so it's really sad when groups of people get together only with other people who agree with them because we miss that opportunity. So moving together also supports social cohesion and pro-social behavior in babies. And I thank Laurel Trainer for uh, uh, sharing the movies with me that I'm going to show you now. So this is work um, from her lab um, that will speak for itself. Okay. So these are mothers and infants who are bouncing uh, with another person, either in sync together or not. And you might need to see, turn the sound up on this one, yeah. Okay. So they're not in sync. And this is what happens uh, afterwards in a helping task. There. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Toddlers this age are not good at helping. Okay, now here's uh, an example where they're bouncing together in sync. Okay, and now watch what happens. And notice that toddlers, as I said, this age are not good at helping. And the first thing they try to do is get an adult to help for them. And just keep watching. So he's looking uh -oh. for mom help. <laughs> oh no. Uh -oh. <laughs> there. Uh -oh. there. So one of my favorite examples from the literature. Okay, so let's move on to Oliver Sacks' impression that there is no analog of this in language. Um, there is a lot of evidence. There is unequivocal evidence that there is indeed rhythm in language. And this is just a, a recent paper that I put up here that looks at uh, one of the fundamental rates, uh, rates of modulation in the languages of the world, which is at the syllable rate, there's also one at the segment rate, and compares that to a fundamental modulation rate in some of the music of the world, and shows that each of them have a fundamental uh, modulation rate. Um, they're not exactly the same, but they each have one. But what's important is that embedded within the fundamental modulation of language, and of music are additional rhythmical patterns which are unique to different languages and, diff and the music of different cultures. But I'll start with language. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but languages of the world differ in rhythm. They've been roughly classified into stress-timed, syllable-timed, and more-timed languages. So when you listen to me talking, you hear a sequence of strong and weak syllables, because English is so stress-timed with relative, but certainly not absolute, isochrony from strong syllable to strong syllable. French is syllable-timed. Je ne parle pas. Je ne parle pas français. I can't even do it right because I put alternating stress 
in even the simplest sentence that I try to produce in French, but it isn't there to the same degree. Syllables are relatively equal timed. And some people argue that languages like Japanese have a subsyllabic timing. And what's important, I'm not going to go through all of this, is that you see these differences in the rhythmical characteristics of the languages of the world that are related to these bigger typological classifications at the level of word stress, at the level of phrases, and the, uh, the temporal characteristics um, are related to the basic word order of the, of the language. So whether it's something like subject, verb, object, as we have in both English and French, um, the man um, kicked the ball, or whether it's subject, object, verb, um, the man, the ball kicked. And the languages of the world differ in that. And there are um, many different ways to me measure rhythm in speech. None of them are perfect. These are a couple of ways that have been fairly influential, but not using either of these. Um, in some work that Isabel was uh, involved in, what she showed is that, or what they showed, is that listeners feel the beat of language just like they feel the beat of speech. And basically, French listeners, French monolingual listeners, clap for each syllable um, given, and that is equivalent, that, that maps on to the stress pattern of French. English monolinguals tap every two to four syllables when you get to that strong syllable in a stress time language. And bilinguals can do both. Babies are exposed to these rhythmical differences starting in utero. So actually a lot of the speech signal gets across um, the uterine wall and a lot of it is um, transmitted through bone conduction and other kinds of movements. But the rhythmical differences of language are probably um, the strongest signal that the fetus um, experiences. And by birth, babies are using these differences. So newborn babies can discriminate languages from different rhythmical classes. They show a, a preference to listen to a language from the rhythmical class they heard in utero. And one of the ways that we test this is through high amplitude, a high amplitude sucking procedure. And basically, um, babies will suck stronger. Sucks are inverse, and they're rhythmical themselves, but they'll increase the amplitude to listen to something that they find interesting. And what uh, Krista Byers Heinlein showed in my lab when she was a grad student is that newborn babies will suck more uh, when there's like they discriminate languages when there's a change. She wasn't the first to show this from English uh, to Tagalog, Filipino here as will babies who were exposed to both of those languages in utero. So having heard both of them doesn't make them confuse them. They can still discriminate these languages from different rhythmical classes. But when asked to uh, show a preference for one over the other, the English monolingual exposed babies will suck more to listen to English, but the English Tagalog exposed babies uh, suck equally to both. So just a quick little uh, demonstration of the uh, high amplitude sucking procedure. Newborn babies, um, the sucking reflex is, is there. Many babies are born with a blister on their upper lip from having sucked in utero. Um, it is in bursts, um, but you'll just see a little bit. That's low pass filtered English, low pass filtered Filipino. So that's the measure that we use, and it's pretty fun. OK. Um, a, recent, a more recent study showed that using magnetic encephalography showed that even fetuses can discriminate languages from different rhythmical classes. And this is work uh, Joan Serino sent me her excerpts. Maybe I won't play them. Um, but using Japanese and English, um, they found evidence that even in utero, babies are discriminating these languages from different rhythmical classes. Now, importantly, it's not just that babies are sensitive to these rhythmical differences, but they arguably use these differences to bootstrap language acquisition. So in previous work, um, Judith Gervain and her colleagues, Jacques Mailer and others, had shown that 
babies are sensitive to um, highly frequent words for pulling out phrases. So I told you about subject verb object and subject object verb uh, uh, word orders. It turns out that subject verb object word orders, like English and French, um, have um, their function words, like in noun phrases or in prepositional phrases, before the content words. Whereas in subject object verb languages, they come after. Now, babies, as I mentioned, can use frequency to parse a continuous stream of syllables into little phrases. So an English baby um, would use, if you had an artificial language with highly frequent, let's say, gays and fees, like the and with, and infrequent other words, syllables like content words, they would parse frequent first, and a Japanese baby would parse frequent second. But what we asked is what do babies do who are growing up bilingual with languages with opposite word orders, where frequency alone won't let them know how to cut each of the languages into different uh, phrasal bound phrases. So I'm not going to go through all these details, but what we did is we played them an artificial language that either had the prosody of a subject-object verb word order or the, sub the prosody of a subject-verb object uh, word order. So OV languages use pitch or uh, intensity, whereas uh, verb object languages use duration more. So after being familiarized with one or the other of those streams, our bilingual babies who were English and some other language that had the opposite word order would segment in the way that the prosody of the artificial language that they had heard would suggest they should segment in the test phase. And uh, importantly, in the test phase, there was no prosody. So they're just all the same intensity, the same pitch, and the same duration. But from that exposure to the artificial language with those language-specific prosodic cues, the Japanese English bilingual babies would segment one way or the other. So it looks like they put together both the statistical frequency and the prosody to break into the word order of whichever of two languages they're hearing, which is, you get to break into that, that lets you know like when a meaningful word is going to come up, um, when it might be, you know, mama or cup or something that's, that is being produced in a sentence and allow a baby then to learn not just the grammar, but also the words themselves. Okay. This is a slide that Annie Patel uh, shared with me. It's been claimed for a long time um, that the music of different cultures shares rhythmical characteristics with the languages of those cultures, or the other way around, that the languages drive the music. Um, and so I'm just going to illustrate this. Um, Debussy, you hear the relative I saw for now. And here's some Elgar, so some English music. I'll give you more. So Annie and uh, Joseph Daniel decided they wanted to test this hypothesis. So to compare the rhythm and language in music, they looked at um, some compositions from English and French composers, granted in a very constrained period in musical history, and carefully selected composers who had not had influences from other countries or other historical time periods. And this really only works under pretty constrained kinds of analyses, but it does work there. Um, so they compared these uh, French and English composers, and they used one of the uh, tools for measuring rhythm in language. They applied it to music. 
And this is uh, basically uh, the intervocalic pairwise variability index. And what this is meant to demonstrate is that languages or they're arguing musical genres that have a high pairwise variability index versus a low one, they each have strong uh, long syllables or long notes and short notes, but what differs is the pairwise variability. So here um, you see that from long to short, long to short, short, versus long, 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 short, 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 short. And they uh, measured, again, um, some Debussy and some Elgar and I won't replay these, uh, but what you see is there is variability even in Debussy, maybe I will replay them, um, but it's, uh, the pairwise variability is not as great as in Elgar, a different. Okay. And then here's a different Elgar. So, uh, the underlying modulation is different, um, but the measurements of uh, English and French, there's always greater pairwise variability in spoken English than spoken French. And in these musical selections, they found this as well. And we went on to kind of test this uh, together um, by uh, looking at uh, perceptual grouping biases in Japanese versus English um, learning infants, um, so a different language, and then we used tone sequences. And what we found is that at five months, they were both sequencing long and short tones in accord with a kind of universal iambic trochaic principle. But by about eight months, um, the English babies were using um, the durational differences to segment these tone phrases and the Japanese babies like uh, Japanese adults were like not sure what to do because you would have pitch accent in Japanese. Okay, so one of the um, hypotheses that guides the shirk part of uh, the work, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council part of work in my lab um, is the notion that culture is a binder for bilingual um, and probably now we think monolingual language acquisition as well. But this illustrates it with a bilingual and that when a baby is hearing a language, they're hearing it in a cultural milieu. And the easiest place to start, and particularly li living in Vancouver, was with babies who are growing up Chinese English bilingual, where they may have one Caucasian parent and one Southeast Asian parent, and they don't usually speak one parent, one language, but maybe more one language from one parent than the other. And can they use the ethnicity and faces to pull the languages apart? And we have some evidence that indeed they can. But of course, not all babies grow up in bilingual environments where um, their parents are from different ethnicities. So one of the questions that we're interested in as well is whether the music of one culture versus another uh, can help pull the languages apart. So we're actually doing this kind of like really out there study right now where we're asking whether um, if we expose bilingual babies to music with the rhythmical characteristics of one of their languages versus the other, whether we'll selectively activate that language, even in a bilingual baby, over the other language. So we're giving them, for example, the fa-va contrast that occurs in English <coughs> isn't used in Mandarin or Cantonese. So if they hear English music first, will they be better at discriminating that distinction? And the qi qi contrast that's used in both Mandarin and Cantonese isn't used in English. And will they be better at discriminating that after hearing uh, music with the rhythmical characters of Chinese? Finally, I want to end by pointing out that we entrain not just to external rhythms, but to constructions or representations that we create. So there's entrainment following learning. And this is work that we've been doing um, 
building on some work that Laura Batterink did, uh, and she's now part of this collaboration as part of her PhD, or maybe it was her postdoc. So a final, one of the many additional problems or challenges that exists in language acquisition is pulling out words from ongoing speech. So with this sentence that's written, there are nice white spaces between the words. And that makes it really easy for you to pull out words. But in fact, in ongoing speech, there are no reliable silences between words. So the places in this waveform where you see um, zero amplitude may sometimes correspond to a word boundary, but often, more often, they don't. And so how to pull out, if you already know a word, like when I listen to French, I can pull out other words, I can find word boundaries by using the words that I know as anchors. But a baby who's just trying to break into language, who doesn't know any words yet, can't do that. So there's been a lot of work in something called statistical learning that shows that babies use transitional probabilities between syllables to pull out words. So uh, this is illustrated by this phrase, pretty baby. So a baby might hear a lot of times, um, a lot of times, oh, you're such a pretty baby, my pretty lovely. Oh, look at the pretty flower. Or they might hear, oh, you're my pretty baby. What a baby you are. I love my baby. And so they hear them together sometimes, but the transitional probability, the likelihood of T occurring, is very high after hearing pre, pretty. And the, likely hear, the likelihood of they predicting B is quite high. But the likelihood of T predicting B is quite low. And statistical learning studies using artificial languages have shown that babies track these probabilities by a very young age. Some labs even um, <clears throat> argue from birth to pull out words from this continuous waveform. So, um, and this is how they do it behaviorally. I won't go through that, but I'll play you the artificial language, um, the beginning of it. Okay, so you just hear a string of syllables. And what happens um, after about two minutes is that babies, it takes adults about 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> babies start pulling out the sequences that have high transitional probabilities. So 2P rho always go together, B daku always go together, et cetera. And babies pull that out and show a preference for looking to one light or the other after this exposure over a sequence um, like rho B da, which has a much lower transitional probability because the rho here has come after P, but a rho later, that one comes after P two. Oh, it's the B. In any event, the transitional probability here is not as high. So it's like an across word. And babies can pull that out. Let me see if I can. So um, we used, as I said, building on um, uh, Laura Batterink's work, we used EEG to test whether we'd see a signature of pulling out words um, in neural entrainment. So the um, oscillations entrain to external stimuli, not just our behavior, our brains as well, as you heard from the other speakers. Um, and so when you first start presenting this artificial language to an adult or a baby, you have an oscillatory entrainment at the syllable rate. But what happens after about 90 seconds, and it's exactly the same time frame for a uh, four-month-old baby as it is for an adult, is they start pulling out the words, and you see another signature of entrainment at the trisyllabic level. Um, so what I'm arguing for, what this shows, is that we entrain not just for social cohesion and emotional attachment and for doing all those wonderful things that we do like dance and play together, but we also entrain, at least in some circumstances, to the information that we learn. So in conclusion, I completely agree with Oliver Sacks. 
um, with one uh, minor modification. So my impression is that a sense of rhythm which has an analog in language is unique and that its correlation with movement is unique to human beings. Um, so looking forward, um, I just want to say that, um, of course, rhythm is important. I've, played, I've paid so much more attention to the importance of rhythm um, since the Kilm ceremony a year ago and since Vladimir and then Andre and all of us decided that we would focus on rhythm together. So I have, I shared some examples of research that we've done looking at the role of rhythm in both music perception and primarily in language acquisition. But this has been a kind of like, these have been side experiments for me. They're not the center of what I do at all. And in most cases, they've been follow-ups from research that other people have done, looking at it perhaps in bilingual babies or perhaps in babies rather than adults. But I'm now convinced um, from these interactions um, that rhythm is probably much more central, and perhaps melody and harmony as well, um, to human um, well-being and development. And so this is going to become a larger part of my work going forward. So thanks to all the participating families, my, my lab, my funding sources, Creative Commons for making images available that we can use. And of course, to all of you, including the people who did all the work. Thank you. It's hard to, to, to ask you a question, of course, because now you know everything. Everything, <laughs> absolutely everything. But there is. Okay, I'm going to be, you know, the, the one. But I do believe what I'm going to say. Um, okay, music really a force to produce sounds together, okay, while language doesn't. Wait, wait. Okay, and so, and language, language, of course, has all those many features in common. You mentioned how, not harmony, I wouldn't say that, but melody, rhythm, uh, all this. But there is one thing, and, and meter, meter as well, especially in English <laughs> with the matrix, and you cited the piece of work that we have done showing that you can clap on, music, uh, on speech like you do on music. It's very unnatural. Mm, fair enough. Okay, and music is very natural. Right. To move and to tap. Right. But what is even more natural, I think, is to, um, yeah, to, uh, to tap in rhythm with the other, to mm -hmm. combine sounds so that it is unique. It's extremely, extremely precise. I know that by alternating, and that you do follow <laughs> my rhythm mm -hmm. for the moment to, to know when you can speak. Mm -hmm. That is, it's not only rhythm, but it's a very important, and you are extremely precise in doing it. Mm -hmm. But to understand what I am saying, you won't talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. But in music, I would say it's exactly the reverse. I mean, the goal is really to play together. It's not to alternate. We do, we can, but it's to play together. So my question is, sure, music and language are analogs. They do. But there are specific aspects, mm -hmm. and this is one of them. And, uh, and, and I have to cite this one. I mean, I discovered it. Uh, it's from Kirch. It's not mine. I wish it was mine. Um, and, just, and so what he wrote in the wrong paper, I can send it to you. Who is it from? Kirch, Stefan okay, Kirch. Yeah. Uh, and he says, he writes, in this sense, what I was just explaining, language is the music of the individual, hmm. all right? And music is the language of the group. That's beautiful, what can I say? Well, uh, can, do you agree? So I, I, do, I don't think that language is music, and I don't think, I mean, they don't, they're, they're, not, they're not the same thing, and they each play special roles. Um, 
and your comment that we make music together and we speak separately is, is definitely true to some degree, but we also sing together, which is a blending of the two. Um, a lot of people... And is it speech? No, 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 that's a good point. Yeah, and is it has speech. Is singing speech? Is singing speech? Well, oh. that's another good question because, of course, you know, following stroke and things, you can sometimes so. sing when you can't <laughs> yeah. speak. Fair enough. Uh, there are some, there are some, I guess, um, people who study the evolution of music and language who look at chanting as an intermediary. Mm -hmm. um, and we also play musical instruments alone, so we don't have to play them together. Um, but um, the idea that language is the music of the individual and music is the music of the group is, is quite, you know, I, I don't oh, have, I don't, it's, it's, it's lovely. So maybe we'll open the floor or the microphone. But I will say that I think that the idea that there are, although the research is far from perfect, and Annie Patel would be the first to <coughs> discuss why it's so far from perfect, but the idea that there might be rhythmical influences, a kind of... Um, um, uh, what I call structural isomorphy between the expressions of culture in music and or in dance and in language is still quite appealing. <laughs> uh, appealing, yes, depending on your point of view. Okay, Rata. Hi, uh, thank you for your inspiring speech. I am a student of Dr. Julie Carrier here. I am in sleep research and I'm not in language research, but I really found your speech really interesting. Uh, I had, I really picked up when you said that it is really complicated to, when there is a trend of, well, when you have many sound together that to make words with that, that it is really not simple as it sounds mm -hmm. and that this thing varies between language. I will speak for myself. I am a French speaker. Uh, I learned English mostly during my college years. I was not exposed to it very often in school, uh, before uh, I'd say 14 or 15. And now when, for instance, I'm listening to TV shows or movies or whatsoever, I find it hard in English sometimes to pick up the words really understand them. And so what I do, <laughs> I watch the movies with subtitles. Mm -hmm. I prefer to hear actors in their mm -hmm. native tongue, so that's what I do. But my question is, will this thing improve with time? Because I don't have the impression <laughs> that it does. So my question is, is there still hope for this basic process to dis discriminate words in another tongue if you were not exposed to it before? I know about critical periods, but I wanted your insight on that. The language doctor. Yeah. I mean, and so this is where most of my research is, is in <laughs> the realm of critical periods and uh -huh. if they exist and what their biological mechanisms are and how um, you might reopen plasticity um, later <laughs> in life. Um, so now you're probably not going to get that much better. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the sad truth. But w one of the, uh, the other uh, things that's very interesting that your comment brought up is that when, you're look, when, you're, when there are subtitles um, in um, a language that you know it's, um, and you're trying to watch the speakers, you have to do one or the other because otherwise they interfere with each other. And so um, you're smart to do one, to just like maybe listen to it in French and watch the English subtitles. Because if it had been, if it were an original French movie that then had been dubbed in English, and then you were looking at the French subtitles, you'd have a lot of difficulty if you knew both languages. But yeah. But for instance, if someone is just listening without the subtitles in a another tongue that he's not familiar with, will it help him or hinder him? That is something that I'm not sure. Does it actually... I mean, I think you'll probably, um, even though there are critical periods and rhythm, the rhythmical characteristics of language is probably one of the most difficult things to overcome because we do start tuning to it so very, very, very early. Um, 
you will learn more and more words as your vocabulary increases. You'll be able to use those as anchors. And you'll probably get sensitive to um, the rhythm at the level of, 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 of highly frequent phrases and frames and things. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my name is Victoria Duda. I am a postdoc student with uh, the University of Montreal with uh, Sylvie Hébert. And, uh, in audiology research. Mm -hmm. I'm actually an audiologist by, mm -hmm. by training. Oh, sorry. There we go. Is that better? Uh, so my question is actually coming from more the hearing perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very excited because uh, something that's fascinated me has been uh, our ability to hear gaps in sound mm -hmm. and how that relates to our ability to understand each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the application right now has been uh, to see if people who have normal hearing uh, but uh, functional difficulties uh, such as tinnitus, so they hear sound all the time, uh, <laughs> uh, are, are they able to uh, hear these gaps in sound? Uh, so my question uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, looking at uh, what uh, you've presented today, mm -hmm. uh, especially um, there was the statistical learning and the NPVI, Mm -hmm. uh, where I saw the, there's the gaps, the intervals um, in between words. Um, do you think, um, based on what you've seen, uh, is there a, a characteristic um, in the populations that you've tested that are unable to make these distinctions between words, these boundaries between words, or unable to hear these spaces um, that is related to anything, maybe their history, their background? Is there any characteristic that's come out? Um, I'm really happy you asked this question, because uh, in fact, those little gaps don't exist between words. So that's, uh, they exist sometimes. So if we have a word starting with a stop consonant, like the ball, there's, there's probably a little bit of gap, a gap there. But in other cases, the air, there's no gap. And there are... Um, linguistic devices like liaison in French, which is basically designed to make sure that there is no gap there, um, because the function word is part of the meaning of the noun. And so um, I think that where we have, so m in many cases, the gaps are perceived. They don't exist, um, like back to the old work of Warren. And um, where we have the most difficulty perceiving those word boundaries is when we're listening to a language that has different rhythmical properties than our native language. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. It was uh, really inspiring and um, all the fundamental work that you've done for critical periods and, and language development is amazing. In your last uh, studies that you're pursuing now, I had a kind of a technical question, actually. Um, so it's really neat that you see the um, the onset of the of the rhythms of the um, syllable groups mm -hmm. when you do the statistical learning paradigm. The very last study that mm -hmm. you presented. Do you think that if you train the babies on the the rhythmic envelope first? then you stop and then you do the statistical learning task and see how they, and they, they capture the group of syllables and the, uh, their brain rhythms mm -hmm. uh, are coherent, coherent with the uh, 1.5 hertz. Do you think it, it can help actually? Do you think babies will learn faster? That's a great question. I think that goes back to, and I've already lost your name, the first question that was asked. And so perhaps, um, so here I'm showing, those syllables, those artificial languages are very artificial. And one of the ways that they're so artificial is that each syllable does stand alone. Um, and it's easier to learn the relations among the syllables if you have little gaps than if you don't have gaps. But um, so we're showing that they, you entrain, you pull out a rhythmicity when there isn't one 
because there wasn't any rhythmicity in those syllable sequences. But what you're saying is, what if we entrained them first at a trisyllabic rate? Would that make it even easier? And I think that the interesting uh, comparison there would be the manipulation that's been done in adults that hasn't been done in infants, where they were given sequences that didn't have structure as well. And so here, you know, bodhiga is a word because they always occur together. But what if it were, if there were no transitional probability relations, would they still be pulling out trisyllabic? Um, you can sort of like pit rhythm against statistics and see what wins. But when they align, that would be really helpful. And then that's where it could go back to the first question. So maybe we could just do, I've always wondered about this, just rhythmical training, just let myself listen to French rhythm for a while before I try to pull out the words, whether that would be helpful. That's great. A great I think it would help, actually. Uh, Janet, uh, I'm delighted that you're you were making music in the language of your discipline. Now we're going to make music with the Killam group. Two quick questions. Is there a difference in language acquisition between baby boys and baby girls? And secondly, is there a difference be between those who are dexterous to begin with and people who turn out to be left-handers? So there's, there are are unequivocal differences between boys and girls. So yes, of course, the distributions overlap. And so you can't make a prediction about any individual boy or any individual girl, but that by and large, many of the milestones, particularly the ones that are driven by general learning mechanisms rather than sort of what I would consider basic language development capacities, uh, there you do see differences. So at the same age, a girl's going to produce a first word on average earlier than a boy. A girl's going to have a bigger vocabulary at 22 months than a boy, both in comprehension and in production. But as I said, that's a, uh, the case for the distributions. Um, and your second question I just lost. Uh, uh, in acquisition languages, in people who are right-handed versus right. those who the, are that's, right -handed. that's been looked at off and on over the years, and I don't think that the evidence is clear one way or the other. I don't think there's a lot of support for right-handers being better than left-handers. People have also looked at just dexterity and whether there's a relation between fine motor coordination and phonetic and perhaps other phonological skills. But, um, and it isn't always the case, so that in most of our brains it's true, you know, the left hemisphere controls many aspects of language production and perception, and for most of us that the majority of fibers to motor control are, are crossed rather than parallel, but it isn't always the case that language Language is more often in the left hemisphere, even in a left-hander, um, than it is in the right hemisphere, although sometimes it switches. And if somebody knows a more up-to-date answer to that question than I know, please share it. No, yeah. it, it fits in with what we know from, say, strokes. Uh -huh. And, and uh -huh. I think our own calculations is that 90% of, uh, of at least adults of the generation that we tend to see have their language still in the left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> it, uh, Thank you.